Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's um, October talk of the Central London RSPB local group. Uh, tonight's talk is titled Unlocking the Secret Forest, an update on, our, on the RSPB's new reserve in the new forest, and it's going to be given to us by Richard Snellings, the site manager there. The talk is going to be recorded, and the question and answers are also going to be recorded, but that's audio only, so just so you know. So I'll now turn uh, the meeting over to Richard. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew, and um, thank you all for inviting me to your meeting tonight. And um, as Andrew said, I'm more than happy to take sort of questions uh, on anything um, that uh, we talk about tonight about Franchises Lodge. Um, so my name is Richard Snelling. I'm the site manager uh, for Franchises Lodge, uh, which is one of the newest reserves that the RSPB has uh, and uh, one of the most recent purchases in the south of England. Uh, my background is I've been in nature conservation for 25 years and um, I've worked for various organisations, most of the big organisations, um, in site manager positions uh, across the south, um, particularly in the southwest, uh, which is where I come from. Uh, and then this opportunity came up to uh, effectively develop a reserve from scratch and uh, it was really an opportunity too good to be missed. So um, luckily uh, they gave me the job and I've been in post now for about um, uh, just over a year and a half and uh, we're making great progress. So um, Franchises Lodge, um, as described here, um, is a secret forest and it's creating a nature rich bridge between two internationally important sites. Um, so those sites are Langley Wood National Nature Reserve to the north of Franchises Lodge and also the new forest uh, site of special scientific interest, which is to the south of uh, uh, Franchises Lodge. And um, it's a site at the moment with lots of plantations, uh, woodlands, uh, wet woodlands, grasslands uh, and a lake. Uh, but these have been extensively managed really for uh, commercial purposes uh, and traditional sporting activities. Uh, and while obviously they provided the value, the land provided the value uh, to the previous uh, landowners, it has actually degraded the habitats uh, considerably um, over the last 200 years. So our job is obviously uh, as the RSPB to restore those habitats. Uh, and as we're looking at them more closely, we're discovering that actually uh, many habitats are quite important. Uh, within the site and many species have been hanging on so we've got something good to work with and a couple of pictures here of uh, spring and autumn uh, and I'd say we are very heavily uh, wooded uh, and um, obviously if you want to come and see the site then please do let us know and if you want to do a visit as you're doing to Raynham uh, to come over and see us uh, then um, just let us know and we can organize uh, something for you and um, as I mentioned, you know, we have uh, various habitats, triple SI woodlands, uh, grasslands, many different um, areas to show you uh, should you come and join us. And we're working closely with our partners um, in the new forest uh, to help us restore the habitats uh, that exist at Franchises Lodge. Uh, and those extensively are uh, the National Park Authority who helped uh, us fund uh, buying the purchase of uh, Franchises Lodge. Uh, and also an organisation called the Cameron Basoka Trust, which I'll talk a little bit more about later on with one of our projects. But we're working closely with all our partners around us, so Natural England, uh, the Forestry Commission, the Environment Agency. All these organisations are working together to help us um, restore the habitats and the species um, in Franchises Lodge. Just to give you some idea as to our location uh, and uh, some of the uh, designations. So um, on the right hand side, um, there is a map there of the new forest. So the big brown line um, around the um, that area is the new forest. And obviously you, you can uh, see the Solent to the south and the Isle of Wight to the south. Uh, and then there's a red block, um, which was the first tranche of land that was bought by the RSPB right in the north there. And um, you might see from the um, um, 
writing at the bottom there that uh, it mentions that it was bought from the Hamper estate uh, as a Lewin tax um, uh, acquisition. Uh, and uh, that was how the first tranche of land came across to the RSPB. Um, the estate had a large tax bill to pay and they were able to clear that tax bill by selling the land to a charity. And luckily uh, it came to the RSPB. If you look to the map on the left hand side, you can see that that area is expanded. So there's a red line through the middle of those uh, red shaded areas. Um, the bottom area being the first tranche, the top area being the second tranche. Uh, and that constitutes the original purchase uh, of Franchises Lodge. So we're around about a thousand hectares or were a thousand hectares at this stage. So about 400, so a thousand acres, I should say, uh, 400 hectares. Um, and we are looking to expand uh, from that area, but that's the area we have at the moment. Um, and you can see there in the blue, you have the uh, a special area of conservation, which covers the majority of the new forest uh, and is all triple SI site of special scientific interest designated. Uh, and it uh, encroaches on our side uh, with two triple SI broadleaf woodlands to the south there. So it's hatched in blue with a red line around it. And then to the north, you'll see two uh, patches of blue within the red area. And there are two triple SI, triple SI grasslands. Uh, so that was the area that um, we orig originally had uh, and I'll see um, across that area we have a number of different habitats. What's interesting though is to just look at um, where things are now. So on the left hand side uh, you can see a map there of how the area of land originally looked like. So you've got a red line there around the first tranche of land bought by the RSPB. And if you imagine to the north, the second area across what's called Hampworth Common there. And you can see it's uh, quite different from what it uh, looks like now. Uh, you can see that um, to the south, there's probably broadleaf woodland moving through to some woodland pasture, opening up into a large heathland uh, which I'll see in, in uh, 1810, which when this map was drawn, you know, would have been pretty rough land, which um, people just put their cattle out onto. And then towards the north, it then again comes into maybe more woodland pasture, uh, some grassland areas that have been actually fenced off, uh, and then into, again, probably broadleaf woodland. What's interesting about that map is that um, between uh, us and uh, the uh, western side of that map, there's not mu much difference. Um, you know, there's clearly woodlands and heathlands. If you look at the map uh, to the right hand side, you can see there that's where we are now. Uh, this picture was taken um, around sort of 2005. And to be honest, not a huge amount's changed. Um, obviously, we're working on that now. Uh, but what you can see there is a huge amount of uh, plantation um, that's um, basically gone right across the site, leaving some uh, fields um, in the northern part of the site. Um, you can see that in the middle there, there's a, an area that seems to be sort of silvery, uh, bluish colour, that's a solar farm. Uh, and then there's a paler area, um, a sort of sandy colour there, and that's uh, a landfill site. So between 1810 and obviously uh, 200 years later, a lot of changes have occurred uh, to the land. And um, if you were to look at these in terms of biodiversity, biodiversity has obviously de decreased uh, quite extensively across the site, uh, which you wouldn't really, um, it, it's no real surprise, you know, in if you are planting large areas with single species blocks. Uh, of woodlands and uh, so that's what we have at the moment we uh, have the broadleaf woodlands but we have large areas of single species uh, block plantations um, and you know they um, transfer through from Scots pine to uh, Corscombe pine um, we've got large areas of European larch uh, we've got some oak plantations as well uh, and, and that's where we are now with, with some uh, grasslands there, as you can see uh, on those pictures, um, which haven't been grazed for quite some time. 
in terms of the habitats, just to sort of go into a bit more detail on those, um, we can certainly uh, see that, you know, with our woodland plantations, uh, they've been heavily planted and weren't really thinned. Um, so that has meant the field layer is quite poor uh, within those areas and it has diminished the number of bird species uh, and other species uh, within those woodlands. The grasslands, as I mentioned, they haven't really been grazed probably for the last 20 years. Uh, and again, they have uh, tended to go towards what, as we would expect, the more sort of rank vegetated species, the faster growing species, and we have a predominance of thistles, rushes and ragwort in those areas. And obviously they're all indicators uh, that those uh, fields um, biodiversity uh, is not as great as it could be and these are all obviously projects for us and we also have a lake there which is shown uh, but it also you can see there's a lot of rhododendron around that lake again the lake um, is you know providing home to some bird species but not as many as we would hope so we have a, a number of restoration projects to achieve particularly across the plantations but also in the grasslands as well and um, we also have a major rhododendron problem uh, across the site. So uh, obviously the, the site was undermanaged for a considerable period of time, which allowed, as you can see here, um, silver birch in many areas to sell seed uh, across the woodlands and also rhododendron to take hold and pretty much uh, cover large areas of the understory. And as you know, you know, rhododendron, tends to um, be um, a very poor uh, biodiverse habitat uh, for species. Um, it obviously has uh, very clever techniques to enable it to take over in terms of smothering the light uh, across the field layer and also raising the pH of the land so that only it will grow in those areas. And, you know, if you look under rhododendron, um, as I know you probably have done, you'll see that there's not much in terms of other species growing in those areas. And consequently, uh, you know, not a very diverse invertebrate population uh, or therefore uh, any other species, particularly birds in our case, which we're interested in. Uh, but of course we are interested in all the species. On the right hand side is, is the map, the pink areas of the rhododendron. Uh, and that was a LIDAR survey that was done about um, five years ago uh, and just shows us um, the extent of the rhododendron. And it is mostly rhododendron. Obviously, uh, holly quite often gets picked up on a, on a LIDAR survey, but for us, uh, we've ground truthed most of this, uh, these areas now and updated these maps. And um, the, the um, rhododendron is very extensive. Uh, but what I'm glad to say is that um, through the National Grid Land Enhancement Initiative, um, we've received £200,000. Um, it did get delayed due to the COVID uh, issues and uh, the National Grid weren't able to meet to make the decision to uh, send over the, the first um, tranches of money for the project. But it has come through now, I'd say, and we're due to start this year. So for the next three years, we're going to be clearing the rhododendron uh, and then obviously we'll be following up after that uh, to make sure that it, um, it doesn't come back. Um, I thought it was worth just putting this slide here. This is a more recent slide and it's not one that's on my notes, but it's worth talking about um, because all those things that I've just um, gone over uh, really sort of come to, um, to be seen in, the, in these two maps. And um, unfortunately, the key uh, hasn't come up very well on this, but I can describe them to you to, to show you what's going on. The map on the left hand side is effectively where we are now. So in terms of broad phase one habitat surveys, um, this is what we're looking at now. And the map on the right hand side is our vision uh, for the future for Franchises Lodge. So on the left hand side, um, you can see in the light green, uh, large areas there, which is broadleaf woodland um, or some oak plantation. Um, and so they tend to be mostly in the south. They are those areas that I mentioned that come under triple SI. And obviously we'll be looking to um, maintain and restore them uh, to make sure that um, they're in the best condition they could possibly be um, for all tree species and other species as well. And we've done some recent fungi surveys through there and, and um, they're 
proving to be in very good condition, which is great news. And then you can see the dark green areas, um, that's plantation working from the bottom upwards. Um, you're looking at the dark green areas, which are mostly larch, Scots pine, uh, moving up through um, some areas of uh, Colescombe pine, uh, and then up into some oak plantations, which obviously we prefer. And then again, right into the middle of the site where there's a broad yellow line, uh, tends to be uh, more Scots pine again. Just looking at that southern half, you can see that there's um, broadleaf woodland out to the uh, eastern side of the site. Uh, and then there's also some blocks of yellow there, and there's a few fields left. Um, and the red dots are where we have two properties. One is uh, called Franchises Lodge, which the reserve is named after, and the other one is uh, Cameron's Cottage, which I'll speak about, and that's what the two red dots are there. But around Franchises Lodge, there's an area of yellow, so we have some grasslands left, which is, which is great. Right in the middle of the site, um, you can see a thin yellow line, uh, and that's a grassland strip which follows originally where the heathland was, but actually is where there's a power line now cutting across. And so consequently, no trees were allowed to grow in that area. So although, um, you know, uh, the power lines aren't that attractive to look at, they actually have been really good in maintaining some grassland across the centre of the site and will give us uh, something to work from. Moving upwards through the map, so going northwards in the lighter green, uh, again, mostly Scots uh, pine plantation, uh, pretty much all, almost all the way through there. Some Corsican in there, not a huge amount. Uh, the small blocks uh, of green are actually, um, they can't tell on this map, they're slightly different colour green than the, the light green below, and they are actually small areas of woodland pasture. Um, so, um, so it's a bit more mixed. Which is great. And then right up to the far end, you can see there the large yellow area that is um, all grassland, um, which is what's called Pimlico Fields. Um, and as I say, unfortunately not grazed for the last 20 years and not in great condition. And then we've got some areas um, in these, the sort of lighter brown there of mixed woodland, mostly uh, oak dominated. Um, and then just coming around that curve there, you can see a large blue dot. And that's our lake. That's where our lake is. And there's a field right next door to that. And um, I'll come back to talk about the lake because it's it's in the project in itself. And we'll, we've been looking to buy more land uh, to use the lake as part of a wider habitat restoration project. So I'll come back to that and just talk about the map for the moment um, on the right hand side there. And you can see it looks quite different and it's a much more diverse uh, picture in terms of habitats and therefore we would hope in terms of species that um, will inhabit those habitats. Working from the bottom there we're retaining all the broadleaf woodland and uh, but we're moving up into what's called woodland pasture so we're intending to run cattle through those areas in many ways not too dissimilar to what happened 200 years ago. Uh, that will allow obviously um, a lot more light on the floor, a lot more um, uh, field layer species uh, to uh, have an opportunity to grow within those areas which they don't at the moment and diversify the field layer. Um, the grassland areas as well will have some scattered trees across them so we're really mixing up those habitats. It's not as clearly defined as that map would show. They're very much about um, you know guilds of habitats um, and species crossing across each other to create a much more mixed picture. Moving up to the middle section, you can see a purplish area uh, and we're intending there that that will be a heathland restoration project. So we're moving from broadleaf woodland through to woodland pasture into um, some scattered trees, mostly Scots pine and the heathland band through through the middle where there was originally a heathland. Uh, and then so this is our vision and then we're moving up beyond the power line into the pink areas. Uh, the pink areas again are a uh, woodland pasture and a grassland uh, combination um, and also we'll probably have elements of uh, heathland uh, encroaching in from, from the, into them so we'll be graduating through, through those habitats. Uh, and then moving up, um, obviously we retain the grasslands we got, but what we would hope is uh, to, with through our restoration project, 
uh, we intend to diversify those grasslands so we get much more wildflowers in there uh, and enable them to become wildlife um, meadows uh, and also wet meadows so we're intending to retain a lot more water on that area uh, and create wet meadows in areas and, and they, again diversify uh, what we have there at the moment um, for many many more species. You can see around those areas the grassland and heathland moves up through but also the light green appears again as woodland pasture so more scattered trees more open glades uh, more opportunity for more species to inhabit those areas more opportunities for uh, our bird species bird, bird species species sorry can't say it tonight um uh taking a foothold uh, in these areas uh, where they've been actually sort of hanging on to small pockets uh, across the area so so that gives you an idea really of uh, the present and um, some kind of idea of the future. I mean, it's purely a vision that, and obviously as we um, work on our projects and uh, we're receiving data back through our surveys, uh, we will probably, um, you know, it'll be quite a dynamic situation on many of these habitats in, in terms of uh, where we take them. Next. So uh, we're sort of moving on to what what have we been up to? So obviously, as I mentioned, I've been uh, on site for about a year and a half now. Um, and uh, we've basically just been building up the RSPB team on, on the reserve. So there's myself uh, and then there's uh, Nika Schofield, who was the uh, community development officer for volunteers on the site. Um, she's now moved over to another role, which is uh, the Cameron's Cottage project officer role, which I'll mention a bit later. Uh, and we've also taken on a warden in the last couple of months uh, to help me deliver uh, the action on the ground. Um, we also have a conservation officer uh, who covers the whole of the new forest and will help be uh, working on the more strategic elements and helping me work on those elements. Uh, so we're working not just on our own site, but in partnership with others around us. Um, and obviously we'll be developing a priority landscape plan, you know, to enable us to... Um, focus our, our energies in terms of making connections with other landowners around us and their habitats and potential habitats and, and supporting species uh, across the landscape rather than just across our own area. Uh, we also have been training up residential volunteers. So uh, we've trained up five so far, far and uh, that's uh, five young people who are looking to get um, into nature conservation um, either on the practical side or maybe working with volunteers or maybe become a project officer or even a, a conservation officer or an advisor or ecologist you know we offer them um, accommodation which we can have a look at in a minute um, and basically work opportunities through the year uh, they can join us uh, to take on any of the habitat projects we're doing any of the species projects we'll get involved in we also train them up with their chainsaws uh, and their uh, brush cutters and they just get an experience uh, for many of the things that they've often learned at university to see how they're actually done on the ground uh, and so uh, we've got two young people now with us three have been trained so far and uh, one's more interested on the volunteer side and the other is more interested on the practical side which is perfect for us because it covers all the bases um, and we've also been mobilizing our volunteer workforce so um, through Anika's work on this, we've got about 400 volunteers now. So we have a really large volunteer uh, workforce. Uh, I would say, you know, somewhere between 50 and 60 of those are really active. Uh, and then but nearly all 400 at some point will come and join us uh, and do some work with us or work on surveys. Uh, and we have different types of opportunities for people. So some people... Um, just used to walk around the site and so you know we've engaged them to become what we call volunteer rangers and they uh, help us spot any issues that are coming up on the site um, or if there's any issues with cattle or, or such things um, then in the winter we have what are called practical task groups tend to be large scale groups obviously that was difficult during the covid period um, but we're back on track now and um, they, there's an example here of a group of people. Uh, there's only two people in that picture there, but actually we had about uh, 30 people out uh, clearing rhododendron on um, uh, a site of um, ancient, it's a, a, a site of ancient monument, uh, one of our barrows, which is on site. 
So we offer lots of opportunities for people. Um, we've also have many surveys. So we have a survey program uh, and people can join on whatever species they're particularly interested in, whether it's butterflies, spiders, dragonflies. We have a survey for someone. Moths teams come out at night, you know, uh, and each of those um, groups, um, whether surveys or practical tasks, all have a leader, volunteer leader, which our warden now helps, um, you know, with supporting. And as I mentioned, we are working closely with our neighbours. So that's, those are ongoing conversations for us uh, with local farmers, with local landowners. Um, many of them have similar issues to us in terms of um, deer browsing, you know, in, in terms of degradation of soil quality. These things affect us all. So we're, we're talking to them and, you know, we're also trying to influence them in many ways as to um, what, what might be the best things for biodiversity, but also for productivity. So, you know, we know that um, in, in uh, fields that are grazed, you know, infield trees, hedgerows really help with retaining moisture, boosting productivity. So there's a biodiversity and a productivity gain uh, to be had there. And obviously those are the things that conversations were having at the moment. And we're joining what's called a farm cluster. So many of us landowners are joining together uh, to form a, a, sort of a landowner's interest group in many ways and start uh, looking at uh, what are the opportunities in terms of habitat species uh, and land management together. Um, so, yeah, that's going quite well. We're just forming that. We're also, also aware that that is very much way DEFRA and uh, the future ELMS scheme, so the Environmental Land Management Schemes, are going to be looking uh, for landscape scale style projects. So the closer we work with our neighbours, the more likely uh, we are to have success. And going towards really, you know, what the Lawton report said 10 years ago, which is about making things bigger, better and more joined up. So that's how we're doing it in practical terms. Uh, and then, you know, so obviously we've been working really closely on removing our invasive species. So rhododendron is our major issue uh, and we're using the volunteers, particularly on the more sensitive areas, uh, to remove the rhododendron. We also have ragwort issues and thistles and, and these are all species uh, that we're just kind of beginning to get on top of. And then we've had a woodland thinning program as I mentioned in terms um, of diversifying our woodlands um, and diversifying those blocks of plantations which were very heavily planted and then never thinned uh, so we have quite a lot of straggly um, specimens uh, and um, certainly it's created a, an issue for the field layer which tends to be quite poor you can see an area which actually has an open area there and you can see how you know, diverse it could become if we had more gladed areas. But um, that's something we're working towards, obviously, with our woodland thinning. And we've also been working on uh, many sort of clearance projects um, with the volunteers. So we inherited um, lots of material uh, and old fencing uh, from the pre previous land management regimes. So lots and lots of uh, pheasant pens and, and lots of buckets and wire all related to that, which we're having to extract from the land, particularly if we want to put uh, cattle across those areas. Obviously, we need to protect the cattle. Uh, so we need to take up all those items. Huge amount of work. Uh, many, many skips have been filled. Uh, just trying to, you know, re restore the land to some degree in the short term. Um, to uh, a reasonable condition before we can then start restoring the habitats themselves. So we're also managing our triple SI fields. Um, we've cut back a lot of hawthorn that was allowed to overgrow uh, in those areas. With scallop dip, so obviously it's still uh, appropriate for species. Uh, similarly with um, a bramble in those areas, we've scalloped those areas as well. Uh, so they're still suitable for but butterflies, but haven't completely taken over uh, the grassland areas and allowing wildflower species to grow up through. We're also maintaining our triple SI uh, woodlands as well and um, just making sure that you know we're spotting the future veteran trees uh, and uh, enabling those to to get away and, and grow strongly. We're maintaining as I mentioned our scheduled ancient monuments so we have three uh, 
Bronze Age barrows, barrows on site. Um, each of those we've had to clear the roads and off, so we did that with the volunteers. Uh, and then there's trees also being planted over them during plantation times. Um, and so again, we're gonna have to remove those trees uh, from those ancient sites. And also we were in this period of planning the future landscape, as I mentioned with the vision that we had a look at uh, and diversifying the habitats and the species uh, and our conservation management uh, across the site. So we're very much in planning mode at the moment and through our surveys receiving a huge amount of data back, which is obviously, uh, you know, informing our plans for the future. So some things we can do uh, quite broadly, but um, we recognise that we're going to have to be quite dynamic with the data that we come back, comes back to us to decide you know, uh, what are going to be the, the best areas and for what species are those areas going to support. So that's something that we're right in the middle of at the moment. Uh, so I mentioned um, one of our projects was to introduce cattle uh, through um, the grassland areas and the woodland areas. And so um, we've been working really towards getting the cattle on site. Um, and as I say, that no cattle have been on site for about 20 years. So we dragged out huge amounts of old fencing, put up some new fencing. Um, you can see on the left hand side there is uh, one of our new troughs we put in place. Uh, and um, the Ruby Devon Reds that you can see here, which belong to Andrew, a local commoner from the New Forest. Um, we just brought those in. So we've got 14 on site at the moment, uh, but enabled you know in order to reach that stage huge amount of work has gone in so you can see the on the picture there where they're all gathered around the trough on the left hand side there's a cattle pen area um the water system itself you know took a huge amount of work to put into place it all had to be put in new um and yes we you know we've built up the base um for the grasslands fields the fields do get very wet and obviously we're hoping to retain lots of water uh, through these fields so that we get some wet meadows going through. The grazing regime um, is, you know, a major project for us, huge amount of investment. Uh, we got um, £70,000 from Veolia to help us purchase a lot of the items to, to enable us to do this, which was great. Uh, and then, um, as I mentioned, you know, we were looking for a commoner, a like-minded commoner, um, who had the right uh, species of cattle uh, to enable us to diversify the grassland initially. Um, so at the moment, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of the faster growing, more ranked species have kind of got away in the grassland areas. And obviously the cattle, you know, with the ripping action, the rasping action that they use, that helps to obviously break up the sward of the grass and will enable uh, slower, you know, but, um, uh, you know, more um, specialised species of wildflower and grasses uh, to to grow through. So, you know, that's that's the plan to diversify the grasslands. Obviously that should help greatly help many of the invertebrate species and in, in particularly butterflies, uh, and then obviously our related bird species through that as well. So we were really pleased. I mean, uh, I'd worked with someone on Exmoor in the past uh, using uh, Devon Ruby Reds, and it was, a, it was really successful. They're just the perfect tool for doing the job. Um, they absolutely love it on our land, which we're, so we're very lucky. Um, and then the next step will be, as we've started to thin out our woodlands, to actually push the cattle through in through the woodlands as well. Uh, and that will enable us to obviously, um, once we've got rid of a lot of that rhododendron particularly, but it will enable a lot of the seed source to be uh, taken through their hooves across um, the woodland areas, uh, also break up some of the soil structure and the compaction that's occurred in some places, um, you know, and, and it also allow water to be retained across the woodlands as well. So they're a vital tool uh, for us. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, uh, rather than use mechanized means, you know, if we can use traditional uh, ideas like, you know, uh, extensive grazing programs, then that's really helpful. And these cattle are um, prized, you know, cattle they are winning a lot of prizes so you know we we feel that we're supporting a local commoner as well which is really important to us and uh, we're also involved in offering him backup grazing which um, rossi works for him as well so so you can see a picture there myself and andrew 
Uh, it, the reason we're looking so happy is it took about six months to get to that point. So um, huge amount of work, but we're, we're there now. So we're really pleased with uh, what they're doing. Um, we're also looking at other um, ways of improving our habitat condition. At the moment, we have a major deer problem. So we're talking to others about our future deer management. And we're part of a deer management group. Um, and obviously, at the moment, we're not able to uh, get any trees away uh, without them being browsed off. Um, and we're getting to the point where we just can't put up more big fencing. You know, it's all, it's just uh, too uh, expensive to keep thinking about that. So how do we diversify our woodlands? We probably do need a change in our deer management um, programme, but we need to do it with others because we're, we're fallow deer, they're travelling across the whole landscape. We know our population is absolutely soaring at the moment and um, it's, uh, it's a major headache, not just for us, but for landowners all over southern England, to be honest, uh, but uh, particularly anywhere that has fallow deer, you know, it's a major issue in terms of uh, biodiversity and for farmers in terms of productivity. Um, so we're um, also, as I mentioned before, removing many invasive species. Uh, we're doing that in part with our volunteers, but we're also doing it with our farmer. So we've been um, knocking back the bracken in uh, a lot of areas. Um, because it has been taking over a lot of the field layer. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, we're mapping the habitat. So we've got our vision. We've done some initial broad habitat surveys. We're now ground truthing those. So we're going into those areas and looking at it more closely. And, you know, what we're finding is the areas that um, have retained some of the more traditional elements of the woodlands and the grasslands are, you know, naturally in much better condition. Uh, than the areas that were heavily planted you know not really a surprise but obviously we need to be absolutely certain about that data and um, what tends to happen as well is that we keep discovering things so occasionally you know I've seen areas of Douglas fir which initially when I first got the site I was thinking that you know I think about removing um, but um, it turns out the uh, the goshawks are nested in those areas so I'm not thinking about removing them now. So, so we're constantly updating our thinking uh, and, and then I say, you know, sort of seeing it in sort of dynamic management plan in a way. We'll, we will, with the data as it comes through, be able to be much more precise about what we're going to do in what areas. Um, so those surveys, you know, they really are going well. So all in all, we've got tw 24 different types of surveys now and they range from everything from uh, fungi and lichens uh, and we've been working with uh, back from the brink uh, and plant life uh, for those surveys uh, right through to bats birds you know, everything you would expect but also um, other things such as reptiles uh, archaeology you know um, everything we need to know so in terms of hydrology as well so from the ground upwards we've got a survey for it. And we uh, intentionally went out to survey very heavily. You know, we intended to be uh, very much data driven for this site because we want to be an example of good practice to other sites uh, across the New Forest and, and obviously uh, within the country, you know. And so if we do it properly from the beginning uh, and we get the right data back uh, and we can, uh, and that data is obviously in a usable format, that will influence our management plan going forward um, and uh, enable us to plan correctly for nature, but also for people as well. We will be able to decide where do we want people? Where's the best place for people to see species? Where do we not want them? You know, where is it far too sensitive, you know, to for even for ourselves to keep going in? Um, so, you know, these are things that we have to think about and plan really carefully. Uh, and we're beginning to build up a picture on that. Um, we've also done a inventory of all the infrastructure. So there's a lot of infrastructure that we don't want, old fencing, bits of pheasant pens and, and those types of operations that were there from the past. But um, we've retained many old gates, pathways, tracks, which are very useful to us. You know, They all need improving, unfortunately. Um, and so we're putting in new gates, um, but we're just repairing many of the, the pathways at the moment. Um, and then we're also thinking about how can people access the site? What sort of signage will be needed going forward? Um, we have a, a project in our back pocket that we're thinking of, which might change how we um, think about accessing the site and, and signage going forward. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but um, 
The other thing you'll see, as you probably would expect, is that we're heavily into um, grant applications at the moment because obviously, you know, we're restoring habitats and trying to uh, restore um, species populations. And so that does require investment. So we, we have the manpower, or we're building up the manpower, but we, we also need resources. Uh, and in order to do that, obviously, we need to make uh, grant applications. We've been pretty successful so far. So obviously, uh, we received uh, grants from um, the National Park, which was excellent, Veolia to help us with the grazing regime and more recently we've received the money from the national grid for removing the rhododendrons so that's that's been really good we've also received money for our um, uh, activity center for young people with the camera of the stoker trust which i'll talk about in a minute um yeah so we, we're you know drawing in money at the moment and we've also made a a large application to buy some more land uh through a biffer grant scheme uh so we are proving to be uh, quite successful uh, in gaining that money. I think people like the fact that, you know, we're restoring a site that needs restoring, you know, and uh, and was in poor condition and we're taking it towards being in, in good condition. It's certainly capturing people's imagination, you know, being in the new forest, as you'd expect, Chris Packham's been down a few times uh, to see us and see how we're getting on. Um, and um, John Ingram's from the Daily Express, also he writes his columns, uh, are particularly on nature restoration projects and, and uh, green recovery for Britain. So he's been down a few times, you know. Um, everybody from all the top organisations have come to visit us, which we're very grateful for. So the head of Natural England, Marion Spain, um, you know, the head of the RSPB has been down to see us, which is really great. You know, um, the head of um, the New Forest, uh, Forestry Commission uh, and the National Park. So all the dignitaries are coming to see us and uh, and obviously as say, we, you know, we're, we're quite happy to host them and show them what we're up to uh, because we do want to influence those organisations um, because we are saying that this site is going to be an example of, of good practice. Uh, and obviously, so we're trying, everything we do, we to try to do uh, within the best of our ability and our resources. So far, we've um, been discovering the species we expected to be there and, and some others too. I mean, in terms of bird species, the surveys obviously have uh, highlighted our hawfinch populations, groups of around 20. Uh, three groups uh, were spotted last year. Uh, the information is still coming through to me for this year, so I will hopefully be able to encapsulate it in, in one data set. Uh, night jars. Uh, spotted flycatchers on site, uh, red starts still hanging on. Obviously, the more we diversify uh, our woodlands, the better that would be. Breeding goshawks, as I mentioned, uh, breeding lesser spotted woodpeckers, marsh tits, of which, of course, there was a, a, a national project, you know, to try and support. But we're very lucky we've got marsh tits on site. Um, as we've cleared some areas of woodland, woodlark have come in to many areas. Wood warblers have uh, established themselves um, in some of the uh, open areas. Gold crests, fire crests, you know, we're incredibly lucky, you know, and the surveys are proving what we did, we're beginning to realise, which is actually uh, Franchises Lodge have been hanging on to these species and was actually uh, a home to many rare species and uh, is an incredibly important place in its own right, let alone being a um, you know, as a site that links um, nationally important areas. It's important within its own right. And I'll see many, many other species as well. I mean, you can see here on the left-hand side, dark-edged bee fly, which was a great discovery, uh, wasp spiders, um, meadow browns, ringlets, lots of butterflies, marble whites, large skippers, um, dark green fertility, silver wash fertility. Yeah, so all these species, uh, golden ring dragonflies, this is the sort of evidence that we were hoping to gain and the sort of species, you know, that we help to uh, hope through our habitat restoration work, support even further. Uh, and bats as well, we've been, you know, we're very lucky considering we're so wooded, you know, um, we've got many different um, species, barbastales, which seem to be inhabiting the trees, which, you know, is, is really interesting. 
the Natters bats, brown eared bats, uh, the pipistrels, and the greater horse bats as well. So, so good uh, numbers of horse bats. We've got, we're obviously doing a bat survey at the moment. Uh, we have a specialist who comes in who works for the RSPB uh, to help us with that, and then he's been training up volunteers uh, to go and find them. And so, um, so we're pretty confident in our data around our bat populations, and the, and they are excellent. And uh, you know, with all the work that we're doing with the woodland thinning that I was mentioning, creating glaze with the controlled grazing, the removing of rhododendron, and creating rinds, you know, we're hoping that many other species will come back. You know, the hair streaks, particularly silver studded blue. You know, we cut some uh, trees down at, uh, at the southern part of the site, uh, allowed that to come back. And we knew silver studded blue in the area and one of our volunteers spotted one on our site, well, which is fantastic news. So we know if we do the right things, the species will come back. And that's, you know, obviously really important to us. Uh, and, and that's what we're here to do. So um, yeah, we are also finding that um, as we begin to wet areas, which we're doing more and more, creating woody dams and uh, and allowing the grassland and areas to wet up, some species are coming back. So, you know, we've been looking really carefully, early marsh orchid, um, rare marsh gentian, marsh ain't John Waltz, the mints, the sundews, the species that we'd hope to come back, particularly as we um, start to move down towards going from wet woodlands to maybe even a valley mire system, more and more of those species will take hold. Um, so they, but they will have to migrate into the areas uh, that we're working on those projects. Uh, and we're also, obviously, you know, I'm talking a lot about nature naturally, as you'd expect, but um, we're also uh, considering the visitors coming to the site. Originally, the site was completely closed off to the public, apart from a couple of public rights of ways. And... Um, People and local people were very much not welcome on the land. And that was how it was known. You know, I was talking to someone from Natural England who used to live close and had uh, grown up um, close to the site. And he said, you never dared go on the site because you might get run off at the end of a shotgun. You know, so, so you had to uh, just uh, keep your head down and, and uh, scoot through the site. And, um, and it was interesting that he said that because we'd heard that. But, you know, sometimes it all seems very anecdotal. But... Um, uh, he's a guy I trust, and uh, you know, when he said it, I, I realised you know that uh, everything we've been told was probably true. So we do have um, a lot of work to do in terms of opening up the site, but making sure that obviously we protect the most important areas. So at the moment, we're just sort of assessing um, the uh, tracks that we've got uh, and the infrastructure around those tracks. Um, we're restoring paths where we want to restore them. We've created a permissive path across the power line area. So we allow people through there now. Uh, and then also um, we're all installing uh, new gates and, and just enabling people uh, to access the site uh, in a way that they weren't able to do in the past. You know, So that's very good. We do have some issues with antisocial behaviour, but we tend to be um, pushing down on those, luckily, and uh, with the help of the police, uh, we're kind of eyeing them out. Um, when we put up new fencing, uh, a few people obviously took against that, um, probably because they couldn't remember they'd been fencing there, but we pulled out all the fencing, so we knew it was there. And um, obviously that will help us with our grazing. Now the cattle have gone in, things have settled down. People seem to understand that uh, it's not to keep people out of those areas. It's very much to keep the cattle in uh, for them to do their job. You know, so that's uh, been uh, good progress we've made on that. Um, and yeah, at the moment we're just planning how we can, in, you know, bring people in safely onto the site uh, and give them the interpretation that we need to give them to understand what they're going to be looking at and, and also what's going to happen in the future because we obviously have a lot of work. You know, our plan is is. Uh, you know, not a five-year plan, it's not even a 10-year plan, it's uh, a plan that will be somewhere in the region of 25 years to 50 years and beyond, you know, and um, and way beyond my time uh, managing the site. Uh, as I mentioned, we have veg uh, residential uh, volunteers and they live in what's called Franchises Lodge. This is Franchises Lodge. Um, we've done quite a lot of restoration on that. These are old pictures now, but uh, we're just building it up so you know it's nice accommodation for them better than most residential 
volunteer accommodation, I have to say. Um, and at the moment, we're just building uh, a new office on the back of that. Uh, and then we'll be looking to build a whole new workshop and a, a new office in this area. Uh, and we're just building up. The garden looks quite different this now. We have a, a shelter in the garden there, and we're tending to use the garden as a wildlife area for young people. So um, sort of um, from the age of sort of four up through to about 14. Uh, so that's the wildlife garden area, uh, and it's sort of used as an educational space. Um, so we've got quite a bit of work to do there. And then we have the other cottage, which I mentioned, we have two cottages on the site. And this is Cameron's Cottage. So this is a is a, um, a view of Cameron's Cottage, which I'll just show you. It was in quite a dilapidated state uh, until recently. But it, this um, film just gives you an idea. Hopefully um, you don't mind fairground rides because it always makes me feel a bit ill. So you can see there the cottage in terms of its context. Um, above it is the triple s dye woodlands and to the south of it um, is the uh, mixed woodlands with some plantation areas and some douglas fir in there and, and that's where the goshawks are sitting up but you can see how buried our you know buildings are within the woodlands and the woodlands uh, are very well established and the vision for cameras cottage is that um it would be uh, renovated to then take small groups of young people uh, with activity leaders, uh, accessible to all abilities, um, and basically provide transformative life experiences, particularly for young people from urban areas who don't have a lot of interaction with nature. Uh, also to educate around what the, about the new forest and, and help us do some projects with those young people uh, you know, removing rhododendron and what, whatever it might be to gain in terms of biodiversity. The whole place is going to be sustainable and off-grid and have a minimal impact on its surrounds. And it's very much about uh, building up young people's confidence and, and giving them a, uh, an understanding of nature and, and connecting with nature in a way that they've maybe never had before. So we're, most of the work in terms of the building works is almost done. You can see here how uh, Cameron's Cottage used to look about a year ago. And then this is uh, where we are now. So complete transformation. Um, cleared much of the vegetation uh, and we will create a wildlife garden area in the front here. The building itself obviously completely transformed. The upper story now uh, has its bunk beds. Uh, so it acts as a bunk house. The lower story has got a common room and a kitchen uh, and an area obviously um, to to learn um, there's also there's a new extension on the right hand side of it which is the shower block uh, and offers uh, disabled access and rooms uh, and then a whole new structure which is a study center an open study uh, area with a laboratory at the back again you know um, which allows people to uh, really experience the place you know uh, and um, we can run many activities there then obviously outside uh, but also undercover if we if we need to be. Um, as well as those groups coming from those urban areas, we're also uh, offering opportunities to local universities, so Southampton and Bournemouth and and uh, London as well, those universities, uh, in terms of using our area for doing surveys to help us with the data that we need to build up. Any projects that are particularly interesting that might be a, of use to us as well. And obviously there's a laboratory there for the for them to do uh, any of their work. So uh, we've done that together with the Cameron Bestoker Trust. Um, so Cameron was uh, a young man who unfortunately died in a skiing accident and um, his parents wanted uh, other children to have some of the experiences that he'd had uh, in terms of interacting with nature. Uh, and he'd got a great, you know, uh, a real sort of boost from that. And so they wanted to offer that opportunity to other children. Uh, and so they gave us uh, about half a million pounds for the restoration of these these buildings and to uh, enable us to uh, develop a, uh, a programme of activities, which we've also got a grant from the National uh, heritage lottery funds to help us do that and then we're hoping to move it to a sustainable model within the next two years where as i say these young people come in and they can do all sorts of activities um 
if uh, the group is from a poorer area, they can get a discount on those activities, you know. Uh, but the main thing is to enable them the opportunity to connect with nature. So huge amount of work has been done there. And as well as all the projects that I've mentioned, we are looking ahead as well. And I just thought it'd be worth putting up this map here um, because um, you can see the red area, which is the existing uh, boundary of franchises lodge and um, we're looking to purchase an area which is called horse common so uh, the esme fairburn foundation has bought it on our behalf uh, and is holding it in trust for us and then we now are looking to raise half a million pounds to pay for that land obviously land in the new forest is incredibly expensive uh, so we're hopeful that we'll um, raise that through a uh, bifr application we it remains to be seen at the moment and um, we're just hoping that you know we get a positive outcome from that uh, it's the reason we really wanted this piece of land it was really important in terms of uh, thinking about future habitat restoration obviously there's many habitats in terms of the woodlands uh, that we can do there and with the grasslands but we had the lake there and we had one of the fields but another field connected to it you can see there um, cr crossing between the red area and the blue area, those fields. And what we would really like to do there is uh, use the lake as a feeder to wet the fields uh, and enable those to become wet meadows or maybe even, uh, you know, depending on the seed source, become a valley mire system. It also mean that um, the woodlands uh, to the west of it as well would become wet woodlands uh, and uh, that would be excellent again in terms of diversifying the habitats in that area so you know we want to wet the woodlands we want to wet, wet the grasslands we couldn't do that without purchasing Halls common um, because if we did flood that area we would have flooded our neighbor's land uh, and obviously they wouldn't have been very happy about that so um so that's the plan so uh, we're hoping that that's going to be successful and it will enable us also um in terms of around where you can see it says cloven hill plantation if we're going to think about, uh, you know, woodland pasture and heathland moving to, through to grasslands in those areas, we really did need that bottom section of Horse Common, which is bounding onto um, Cloven Hill there, and in order to do, make the most out of that project. So that's what we're doing with on our boundaries. And then around us, uh, we have a number of different estates. Uh, you can see Langley Wood, uh, right to the top of that map there, that is uh, the National Nature Reserve, which belongs to uh, Natural England, um, a broadleaf mixed woodland, um, and is uh, obviously highly designated. And we would like to connect with them if we could. Uh, there's a few fields in between us and them, and, and we're hoping that um, uh, either we can purchase those fields from the present landowner, or we can bring them into a, a shared management system it would be you know really great for us it'd help us to develop some fen grasslands which would be you know again another diverse habitat to support different species um to the uh western side you can see loosanger cops there to the top of the boundary that again is another site of special scientific interest um a broadleaf woodland and that belongs to the new house estate but the new house estates are selling at the moment and so we're hoping that um, we may pick up some uh, land around there. Uh, copper, loose hanger cots would, would be great for us in terms of connecting with our own woodlands. Uh, and there's also a finger of land that comes down uh, from there, which is called Qua Hill Plantation there. And it sits between us and the landfill site. And we're particularly interested in the landfill site. Um, it might sound strange. I mean, it's obviously land in really poor condition. But we're thinking that, you know, if we want to invite people onto the site safely, um, then that might be a great place for a visitor centre. At the moment, our main access uh, is, you can see on the main roads on the bottom of that here, there's a Y-shaped junction. Our main access is on that Y-shaped uh, junction, and that junction is quite dangerous. So, you know, we would be quite keen to purchase the land higher up the road there um, on the B3080, and um, if we could, we could potentially have a visitor centre there and a safe access into the site, uh, which would go. And, and also it would allow us to have opportunities for people uh, to, you know, 
explore the woodlands without if they don't want to go too far or into more sensitive areas they wouldn't go into those areas you know so it helps it would really um diversify our um options for visitors you know and give people many different things some people you know just want to go uh, and have a cup of tea and go for a short walk some people really want to explore for a couple of hours we could give them all those options uh, which we don't have available to us at the moment so that's some we look at and we're in we're good we've got good relationships to the south of us uh we've got the lyburn estate um, so on the other side and uh, up towards what's called hamworth common um land there so it belongs to um the anderson family but they're looking to sell that at the moment so we might have new neighbors we're working really closely with all these neighbors we're all part of what's called the farm cluster um we know that whatever we do will impact you know on others and then you know the <coughs> the big area to the bottom of the map obviously that's the commons uh we're not part of the commons that's the what's officially the open forest um the new forest area that uh, is mostly managed by the forestry commission again you know what we do impacts on them what they do impacts on us so you know we're in continual sort of conversations with them uh, about what our plans are for the future and, and i'll see uh, what their plans are in terms of the uh, new forest uh, triple si as well and uh, we've got many many opportunities for people to come and join us in terms of survey groups weekly work groups uh, specialized groups um, so we're organizing groups where people like to do specific things some people like to do streaming some people like to do fencing some people like to build up banks and and we've got a lot of historic banks many people just want to do surveys all for particular species they're particularly interested in and we can cater for all those so we're inviting everybody to join us which is why we have so many volunteers um and and obviously so many people in the local area supporting us and we offer those opportunities to all abilities and obviously we train everybody up as the as the pictures tend to show here you know so all ages um you know bat survey there uh, in the middle building a uh, a bug hotel uh, to the right hand side you know anything that uh, someone might be interested in in terms of helping us uh you know support species support our habitats then we we welcome them to come and join us and that's about it and uh I think, as I said to Andrew, probably uh, the questions more often than not are uh, more useful to people and I'm more than happy to answer anybody's questions and um, and explain a bit further on anything um, that I haven't explained there. Okay, thanks very much, Richard. Uh, it was very interesting and informative. Um, so throw the meeting open to questions. Um, and we'll try and accommodate everyone. Please bear with us if we don't see you immediately or you might be part of a queue <laughs> so thank you uh, hi graham go on yes please uh, how accessible is this site by public transport um, uh it's it's not too bad um graham was it was that yeah. i can't see uh can't see you graham but um yeah um if you drive up um from the motorway towards the northern part of the site um you can come along what's called roger penny way which is a pretty direct road okay. and at telegraph hill which is where that y shape junction i showed you there's a car park there that belongs to the forestry commission telegraph hill uh car park so the best thing to do is park in there and then just walk across the road to our site and then that takes you on to one of our byways so we have two byways so pretty easy to walk around and we've as i mentioned created a permissive path now along the uh, power line so you have um, two smaller loops and one large loop in which you can access the site and you know you can get a pretty good picture from those it's very quiet we, we're not having a huge amount of visitors at the moment so you know if you're looking to you know spot birds as you're walking through them from those paths you're pretty much you know spot most things um, the goshawks obviously they're a bit more hidden away but we tend obviously not to um talk about their locations because obviously we're looking to protect them uh, and that's true of some other species as well but um you know on those pathways i think most people have seen nearly all our species at some point and ca can you get there by public transport uh i believe there is a 
bus that goes to no man's land, which is nearby. <laughs> and there's probably one that goes to Lover as well. Um, Lover is Red Lynch, which is to the north of us. Uh, no man's land is just to the south of us. I'm pretty certain buses do go through there. And then you've probably got um, a, a sort of 20 minute walk to the site from there. Um, we are going to talk to uh, the National Park about having a bus stop uh, somewhere along Roger Pennyway. It's just a really tricky road for buses to be stopping. I can I can understand why they haven't done it, and we would probably have to create a lay-by or something to enable that to happen. And obviously that's um, entered into uh, planning issues around it being common land. But um, certainly, yeah, if you were on the bus, I would say go to No Man's Land, go to Lover, and you'd probably be able to access us, no problem. So, so the, the place is open for visitors now? Yeah, I mean, you can use those paths. I mean, we're, we're not sort of, we don't have an official opening as such, as some sites do, you know. Um, we are open to the public because people can access us, you know, through the public rights away uh, and through our permissive path. And we're, we're quite happy, you know, for people to do that, to use those public rights away and the permissive path. Um, so we're not we're not closed. We're not a closed site, but um, we have because you know we're starting from scratch. We have no visitor infrastructure, so we have no visitor centre. Um, we have no um, parking area. We have a hard standing, but there's now planning permission for parking. Um, we've put up some signage to help people and able to get them around and you know the site. Um, and um, yeah, you know, many people do come and see us and have a wander around and uh, and also are beginning to see the changes, you know, that we're beginning to instigate and uh, and some of the projects, particularly in terms of the woodland thinning and the, and the cattle now being on site, you know, those sort of projects and um, and seeing what species they can. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I believe Simon wanted to ask a question. Simon? Yes, please. I was just wondering, to what extent has the acquisition of this bit of land uh, improved the RSPB's influence over the open commons as a whole? Yeah, it's an interesting question, Simon. I mean, uh, one of the things um, that the RSPB want to do is get a foothold within the new forest because, um, you know, surprisingly, it, it didn't have one. And then it purchased small area land and then Franchises Lodge came up in, and that gave them the opportunity and certainly, you know, the RSPB has wanted to be within the conversations uh, occurring, you know, in the New Forest. And we've always had a conservation officer and we have a new conservation officer now, a good guy called Nick Tomlin, who's um, taken over that role. And obviously that's an influencing role. That's, you know, one where we can develop our strategic plans. But we have a lot more influence in terms of that by having the land holding within the New Forest. I mean, it gives us a lot stronger position and also gives us an opportunity to demonstrate what we're talking about, you know, in, in terms of habitat restoration, in terms of uh, species restoration projects, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's certainly brought us to the table and people are much more interested now uh, in what we've got to say, which is, which is great. And obviously we're looking to expand. We're, inv we're getting involved in all the local landowner um, groups as well, you know, so we're involved in those conversations which we weren't, you know, before. So, yeah, it's, it's really helped. I think, um, I mean, I've been to a lot of uh, strategic uh, meetings, you know, on the future of the new forest. And, and, I, and I feel that, you know, franchises really helps us to uh, sort of demonstrate what we're, we're, we're talking about, you know, and that, and that makes a huge difference to us. And it strengthens Nick's arm as well, you know, with his, he has uh, his priority landscape plan, and he's also, you know, obviously um, contributing to uh, the special area conservation plan for Natural England and the partnership plan for the National Park. All that really helps if you've got a land holding. Uh, and then the other thing is, you know, we are working with a local commoner. So he's our grazier. So uh, there are many, many different organisations working across the New Forest. Uh, many more than the next more I'm finding. Um, and uh, so there's, we're involved with probably about 50 different groups. Uh, many of them represent commoners, so the verderers uh, across the New Forest, the um, Commoners Defence Association, others represent archaeology, others represent particular habitats, uh, particular species projects. So there's a Pine Martin project with Wild New Forest and uh, and also a Hawfinch project with them. So we're 
we're having now we have land you know they've they need to talk to us as well as us talking to them you know and that really helps so uh, and certainly with having the commoner that's giving us uh, a foot in those conversations about what happens across the commons you know and um and how we can think about helping uh the grazing pressure on, on the on the commons themselves you know so yeah it's uh, it's really made a huge difference i think simon thank you that's very encouraging <laughs> thanks uh can i ask what are the what are your thoughts about you mentioned how deer were quite a big problem mm. um yeah so what are your plans for managing deer overpopulation yeah it's a it's a difficult um question andrew you know it's a difficult problem to tackle you know and um and it's not one that we can do on our own you know we know that um from our own surveys and our nighttime surveys as well that the population is soaring you know um and uh, it's uh, been moving up so we've got the probably somewhere in the region of five thousand uh deer cutting across our site sorry 1500 uh, cutting across our site um you know in terms of sustain sustainable deer population that's just not manageable so you know many of them are not finding enough to graze so they're in pretty poor condition um you know so obviously we we have a present sort of deer management program in place but it's not really helping and it certainly isn't helping our woodlands or the farmers around us uh, so we're talking to them, you know, as part of the farm cluster group to think about how we can manage deer into the future. Uh, as I say, we've got a population of about 1,500 cutting across what was the old Hamworth estate. Uh, you know, that's probably somewhere in the region um, of 1,200 too many, to be honest, you know. And that population has been growing through our surveys, has been growing uh, by sort of 50 to uh, 60 animals a year. You know, uh, so it's going up and up and up. And obviously, in terms of us getting a tree away, we just can't. We don't have any new growth uh, coming through at all. You know, even, you know, uh, in the gladed areas that we're creating. So we know that we're going to have to manage the deer somehow, but we can't do it in isolation. So we're talking to all our neighbours um, in terms of what's the future going to be and uh, maybe changing the model. You know, um, the stalking model at the moment, is not one that we're particularly comfortable with uh, around trophy heads and we would rather it move towards a more sustainable venison market um, but that will need an you know investment uh, and support I mean certainly uh, when I was working on Exmoor that was fairly well established you know and, and you wouldn't expect to go to Exmoor without uh, having a venison burger or steak at any hotel restaurant or pub but strangely, in the New Forest, you will not find that. Uh, and yet they've got these soaring deer populations, you know. So, so there's something in there in terms of a sustainable market and doing the right things for other species, you know, because one species, unfortunately, is taking over the habitat. Can I ask a question? Hi, Jane. Yes. Hi. Um, thanks, Richard. A really interesting talk. Very inspiring. Um, so I guess with management of animals, the question I had is just about dogs <clears throat> and um, what plans there are with um, visitors, dogs, particularly as you've got ground nesting birds. Mm. Uh, yeah, an another tricky questions uh, to answer, you know, uh, and find a solution for, you know. So obviously we... We have put up signage, as you'd expect, across our reserve, uh, you know, in terms of the legal framework that, you know, dogs must be always be under control or, or be seen to be under control. Uh, and so, you know, we've done that and we've obviously we've met up before the COVID lockdowns, met up with local communities and, and talked about that. The other thing that um, is helping us, you know, sort of manage that issue is that we did restore the fencing around large areas. So we have three really large compartments. Um, each of them is around 60 hectares each, you know. So those areas obviously keep the dogs out. I mean, they don't stop people from walking around the site or using the public rights away. Um, but it does mean that um, it stops people cutting through, um, you know, those areas where our ground nested birds would be or should be, um, and certainly where our cattle are. Uh, and also the deer as well, you know, I mean, we, you know, you know we're just talking about deer uh we 
have had issues with dog attacks on deer uh, when I first started, and um, that's something that we've managed to get under control now uh, by talking to the local community and, and also just dealing with a few Brockman people, uh, with the police, you know. So, yeah, we're, we're on top of it now. I think, you know, it's, it's very much around us, you know, providing um, a proper vista infrastructure to allow people to go into less sensitive areas with a dog and, and maintain those messages. And there'll be areas where we'll see them and we'll be able to talk to them. Uh, and then there's other areas where we're just, we're having to exclude people completely, partly because we've got a grazing regime in there. And honestly, we're trying to restore those habitats through that grazing regime. So um, so it offers a sort of double whammy on, on that, you know. But uh, I mean, we're pretty good. I mean, we're, what we tend to find is our neighbors are not bad. You know, occasionally people coming into site who are not from the local area, but their dogs have been, you know, sort of running around all over the place. But the local people um, tend to have their dogs almost always under control anyway. So we're not we're not so worried about them. You know, it's uh, but uh, messaging is the the main thing. Talking to local communities, excluding some areas, make, but making sure our um, footpath infrastructure is up to scratch and and that we're sort of directing people to to the areas where if you do have a dog, it wouldn't do any harm. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jane. May I ask a question, please? Of course. Um, yeah. That Cameron Cottage, is it also open already? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, it's, it's for invited groups. Right. Um, so um, if there's a group, you know, um, let's say we have a target audience. I mean, that's part of how we got the planning to redevelop it because um, generally the New Forest... Uh, planning so you know uh, department is pretty strict on what right. can and can't be built uh, particularly within green spaces such as our own you know but also we received planning permission because it was it's particularly targeted at, at this 14 to 25 year old um, age group you know uh, coming from uh, areas of deprivation uh, you know that don't have opportunities you know um, to connect with nature you know, and we can offer opportunities to uh, enrich people's lives. So that's that's the idea behind the project. Um, obviously, we're offering it to students as well. If they've got a particular project they want to do, we do want permanent occupation of the site because, you know, we want to make sure that um, the site is secure. Obviously, it helps with the fact that we have um, our residential volunteers in the other cottage and, and, and they're checking it each evening and, you know, but we're beginning to get groups through. So we have the Prince's Trust in um, with um, some young people, you know, from a tough area. Um, we've had Black to Nature in. We've had uh, Go Ability. You know, we can cater for any group um, who are looking for that opportunity. And as I say, there, there's going to be discounts around that. Um, my colleague Anika is handling all that and we've just taken on a new administrator to help us. So, so we're up and running um we're just basically teething out all the problems at the moment you know the, because it's a new build we've had issues with showers and and you know just all the basics really that <laughs> having a new building throws up so um we're just working our way through those but you know we're ready to accommodate groups and, and the groups are beginning to come in cool thank you that's okay can i ask a, can I ask a question go on cynthia Thank you. Um, thanks very much for the talk, Richard. It's really interesting. Um, I was wondering, are you going to develop a visitor centre and are you going to develop things like bat walks and talks and mm. such like? And if so, sort of how long before you think that's up and running? Yeah, I, it's, uh, I think in terms of our visitor offers, uh, offer, Cynthia, we're going to, um, we're already kind of beginning to do that. So, we're offering opportunities for people to come on um, bird walks and bat walks. And if a group wants to come in, say like yourselves, you know, we can offer, you know, we've got Saul, our new warden now, to take people around, you know, and uh, and, and just show people around the site. So we're doing that, um, but we don't have any infrastructure as such, you know. We can just do it through the resource of the people we have. Um, so that's how we're tending to hand it. So if something comes up, uh, within the new forest there's some sort of um, 
uh, festival, you know, of walking or whatever it is, we, we always offer something, you know, um, mm. if there's something around uh, habitat projects, particularly that National Park is promoting, then again, we offer something, you know, uh, you know, to talk about. And so that's all there, you know, um, with our volunteer groups, we ask people just to come and join us, you know, and see if they in, they enjoy it, you know, and, and whether, and then, you know, it's a chance to learn. And, you know, it may not be, say, the bats in the example, it may not be for them doing the surveying, but they learn a lot in that, in that one thing. In terms of the visitor facilities, it's, it very much is around, uh, as I mentioned, the purchase of Pound Best Bottom uh, landfill sites. If we can get a hold of the landfill sites, then that completely changes what we can offer. And, uh, you know, we could build a proper visitor centre there. And, and also, we, you know, we, what we'd like to do is have a hub uh, for all the conservation organisations in the northern part of the New Forest um, and, and give us an opportunity to have a, a work base uh, with Natural England, uh, you know, join up. And, you know, we would like to work together with them to, in effect, create like a super uh, national nature reserve, you know, and, and connect up with our management planning with them uh, and do it together, you know, across a landscape scale. And, you know, what would be really great is if we could have a, a joint hub or base with them um, at Pound Bottom. Whether that comes off, who knows? I mean, it's very much down to the present landowners, whether they that's the option they want to go with, you know, and, and fingers crossed they will, because we tend to sort of feel not many people are going to want a landfill site. You know, you can't build on it. <laughs> um, you can't do a lot with it, really. And um, and whatever structure we do put on there, we know it's got to be pretty light because it, it cannot, um, the way that the landfill's been developed, you know, is it has what's called a pie crust. So about um, six metres of soil put on top of it. You can't break through that with foundations. Otherwise, you break through into the, the tip itself, you know. So any structure you put on there's got to be pretty light. Uh, so you're not building houses on it, you know, um, or offices or anything like that. So we feel that we're in a strong position. You know, I can't, we can't imagine many other people would want it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And it's right next door to us. And it would offer some really great access opportunities into the heart of the reserve without people having to travel a long way, you know, um, as they do at the moment along our byways to to get to the heart of the to the reserve so that's the plans Cynthia we're offering some stuff if you're interested just keep an eye out we've due to have a website uh, put up pretty soon we won't have an official reserve website because we're not um, uh, you know a developed reserve like many of the others across the country but we do we will offer opportunities for people to come and access the site and get involved okay thank you okay well I think uh... I think we seem to have uh, run out of steam, but uh, I'd like to say it's been a very interesting um, talk and discussion about what's an exciting project in a, what I think I'm right in saying is our newest national park. Um, and it's good that the RSPB has got a quite a big foothold there. Um, so I'd like to thank Richard for the talk and like to thank everyone for coming along and we'll see you all soon. So thank you everyone.